Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Marianne Schnall. I'm the founder of What Will It Take Movements. Um, and I'm very excited to have you all here with us today. Um, before we begin the conversation, I just want to give some context to uh, you know, what brings me here to lead this conversation. I had uh, written this book called What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Conversations about Women, Leadership, and Power. Um, this book was inspired by a question by my then eight-year-old daughter, Lotus, who asked me this very innocent question, Mommy, why have we never had a woman president? And, you know, as a journalist, I decided to investigate, and I went to all sorts of different notable figures, ranging from Gloria Steinem to Anita Hill to Maya Angelou to Melissa Etheridge to Sheryl Sandberg to Kristen Gillibrand. Um, just looking at this question about why we haven't had a woman president as a lens into why we don't have more women generally in sort of all different sectors and industries. Um, and this so sort of whole journey with the book, which included a very surreal moment when Beyonce recommended my book about a, a year ago, um, made me decide to launch this platform, which is What Will It Take Movements, which is a media collaboration and social engagement platform, which you know seeks to in engage and inspire women to advance in all levels of leadership and take action, and also to be kind of a connective tissue to amplify all of the many groups and organizations that are working to advance women's leadership because we're stronger together. Um, what Will Take Movements is very proud to be part of the of Intentional Media, the part of the family of brands, which also includes SOCAP. So very excited to be part of this event and to be working with SOCAP. Um, and you know, to me, uh, this conversation here today, you know, when I was doing the book and all of my interviews about what strategies we could implement to advance women's leadership, one of them was the reframing of you know, gender equity and the need for more women leaders. This isn't a women's issue. It's often sort of siloed as a women's issue, whereas it's a human issue. We all benefit from more equal representation, from a reflective democracy. And, and also, you know, men increasingly want to be included in this work. Um, they realize that you know, everybody benefits from a more equal, just world and from my, by women's voices and visions being represented. But I also think we can all think of some examples of how negative it is for men and boys, these constrictive gender stereotypes and gender roles. Um, so I think we have to have men be part of this conversation. And so, um, and particularly in this moment, I think in the wake of Me Too and there's sort of fresh you know, conversation about the need for more diversity and women leaders, it's a really fertile time to have this conversation. And so I am really honored to be able to have the conversation with this esteemed panel um, who represents all different work and perspectives um, as a lens into talking about these issues. And um, I'm not going to do you know, long bios and take up our time when we do want to leave time for questions. Um, but I do encourage you all to check out Pathable or, or online because they all do amazing work and are attached with incredible organizations. Um, so right next to me is Ted Bunch. He is the co-founder of A Call to Men. And then we have Adrian Becker, who is the CEO and co-founder of Level Forward, and uh, Mauricio Mota, who is founder and co-president of Wise Entertainment. So first of all, thank you all for being with me here today. Um, so I'm gonna start, uh, Ted, with you. Um, so, you know, as we've been talking about, Me Too has sort of spurred this national re reckoning, you know, a very long overdue important conversation about sexual harassment, about violence against women, and also about sort of this larger issue about how to harness, um, you know, the full potential of women in the workplace. And I know that you and A Call to Men have been working inside corporations in terms of trying to help them figure out how they can shift culture and also address these issues. So from your perspective, what changes have you been seeing? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Marianne, for your leadership and vision in this space. Really important. Um, so what we've been seeing, so first of all, just let me share that A Call to Men has been in existence for 16 years. We were founded in 2002. So we've been doing this work in this space for a long time, and um, uh, early on, we thought we were a bit ahead of ourselves because, uh, or ahead of our time, because uh, no one was really interested in what we had to say. <laughs> but they are now, um, because we really are talking about this moment in time, which is a very, it's a, it's a cha it's, it appears to be a challenging moment, but it's a very exciting moment, actually. There's a paradigm shift that's happening that's long overdue, and it's a benefit to all of us. And it's a little frightening to men 
because, we're the, because we don't quite know how to navigate it. It's not a bad thing for men. Don't, you know, I'm not saying that uh, in, in any way that it's a bad thing for men, but I'm saying that men don't quite know how to navigate it because we're the first generation of men being held accountable for something that men have always gotten away with. So how do we handle this? We're also the first generation of men who can be intentional about truly respecting and valuing women and girls. So when we talk about gender equality, it's not only about uh, being allies, but standing in solidarity with women. That's where we want to be. So uh, with this Me Too moment uh, a year ago when all of these things happened, it was uh, a reckoning, as you say, where every man had to really look and reflect about how am I impacting other people, especially women, because it's so challenging. Why men are concerned is because all of us have done something. That's why. There's not a man that exists that hasn't either done something or said something that was sexually objectifying a woman or discriminatory toward a woman or witnessed another man doing that or saying that and did nothing about it. He does not exist. Doesn't exist, including the men on this panel. Doesn't exist. Because one of the ways that we prove that we're men is to do these things in this definition of manhood that we have currently, which is based on male dominant sexism and patriarchy, of course, right? But one of the ways we prove ourselves that we're men is by objectifying women. So, we, so what happens in the workplace is just exposing, it's a microcosm of the larger social issues, cultural issues we have. So it's very frightening because men don't know how to navigate it. And we need to be in this space because we have to reflect, we have to make changes. We're all looking in our rearview mirror. I was doing an article, I think you may have assisted on this article, for the Huffington Post about two days after um, Harvey Weinstein occurred, right? The allegations. And I did this article, I'm hitting send, and Mauricio, oh uh, man, I, men in the room, I was adjusting my rearview mirror like, oh boy, when I hit send, is someone gonna say, well, wait a minute, Ted, right? Because there were times, not in a long time, but I've been at the water cooler, or I guess it would be the Keurig, right? The Keurig now where a sexist joke was said and I didn't say anything about it, right? All of those things. So, we're, so it's really a, a cultural shift and that most men don't do these things, but we are silent about those that do. And that's as much of the problem as the action is, whether it's violence or sexual harassment and so forth. And um, you know, I'd love to talk at some point, hopefully we'll talk about how we continue to pass these messages down to our boys and how they're really be gonna be just as harmful in their generation as we are in ours if we don't start doing something about it. Um, and before I quickly go on to Adrian, I just wanna just, for, for intangible things in terms of what you're seeing inside corporations, okay. what does it look like to you know, start to try to shift the culture? Well, what it looks like is that uh, corporations are calling us in now because it really is about the culture of the workplace, not about, you know, uh, there's always been kind of a mandate for corporations to have a sexual harassment training every year, right? You go through the training, it's usually a legal conversation of what the legal issues are if somebody does sexual harassment, and it's done through HR. It's really an HR thing, and we all check the box that, yeah, we went to the sexual harassment training. But now, we're being brought in to look at the culture that allows sexual harassment to exist and deconstructing that and challenging that, which really means all of us looking at our behaviors. It means looking at not only how we're viewing women in the workplace and the things that we're doing that are not necessarily sexual harassment of a sexual nature, but gendered, right? Like she's always the one taking the notes, even though we're all equal in the room, things like that right, that, um, uh, 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 that women are not promoted in the same rate that men are, that women are not paid the same wage that men are, that all of these things have to be challenged because the culture of male dominance is being challenged in the workplace. So those are the things that are really, ha those are the conversations we're having, and also not only about women, but also about the LGB, trans, and gender nonconforming individuals as well and how they're impacted because there's so much language that also is harmful to them. There's so much harassment and uh, hostile work environment issues that are also really difficult for them. So those are the conversations that are finally happening and also the conversations about men 
feeling how they can navigate this because what also often happens when you challenge an oppression, as you all know, is that when we, we, and we challenge male dominance, which is sexism, then sexism rears its ugly head and wants to, and wants to push back. So having conversations like, uh, and I'll just say this one example and I'll pass it back to you because I don't want to take up too much space, but uh, a very common thing when we're doing these sexual harassment trainings are things like a well-meaning man, a good guy who would never sexually harass someone, saying things like, well, you know, I think that the best thing for me to do is just not have closed door meetings with women because I don't want anything to be misinterpreted. Like, oh, well, first of all, the issue of closing the door and who was safe and who wasn't, it was women who weren't safe. So she should really be more concerned about being behind a closed door with you based on what we know, right? But that's what we do, see? We don't mean to do it, but our setting is that we, we lean toward giving men the benefit of the doubt. And this is one of those ways we do that, where we blame women for the violence or the discrimination that men perpetrate, in the same way that we blame women for, oh, what did she have on? Is that the dress she wore? Those types of things, right? So to challenge those things, and also to challenge in saying, if we're gonna have that as your policy, that's your new procedure with women, then that needs to be your new procedure with men as well, because it has to be fairness. This is about fairness and equity, right? If I'm I'm a black man. If I have 10 employees, and I'm talking to the, my, black, my white folks in the audience, I don't see any black folks out there that, I can, that, are, that are men anyway. I'm a black man. If I have 10 employees and there's five black employees and five white employees, and the black employees get to close door meeting, and the white employees, oh, just leave that door open, please. Wouldn't you all think, like, what, what are they talking about in the closed door meeting with the black folks? Like, what's going on? That's discrimination. Like, what is wrong here? It's the same thing. Right? So we have to look at what equality looks like. And um, so, so those are the conversations we're having. Thank you so much. Um, Ted and I have worked together for years. He has been leading this work uh, for a very long time. So thank you so much. Um, Adrian, so Level Forward was also born out of Me Too um, to champion projects that are spearheaded by female creatives and people of color. Um, and obviously we have, you know, for people who are here who have the ability to shape an organization, um, from your experience, you know, what, what are some of the most important considerations and what do you think are some of the common missteps? So Level Forward, I would say, is focused on new voices attacking old problems. Um, whether those are female voices or persons of color or male or any of the marginalized groups that we all can list, uh, we believe fundamentally that through inclusion, you can get natural innovation. And from innovation, you create enduring impact. Um, and we do this through both business process and creative storytelling, and making sure that those are aligned. Um, the story, the stories that we tell influence culture in uh, exponentially magnanimous ways. Um, they are uh, the fodder for coming outside of who we are. Uh, it gives us, we talked about this last week in New York, giving us a chance to rise up from our skins, out of our bodies, and away from our prejudices. And so the power of storytelling in this moment we think is profound, but we don't want to forget the power of process behind the story because that's where you get uh, the questions about closed door meetings, that's where you get the question about how you value employees, what kind of compensation you provide, that's when you really understand the nuances of sources of capital and how sources of, sources of capital can be very limiting um, and can perpetuate narrow interpretations of a world where not everyone belongs. And that's kind of fundamental to us. Um, but this, these issues are, to Ted's point, absolutely intersectional. Uh, today, we announced an initiative called Gun Neutral, which while not directly uh, about gender, um, says that the per perpetuation of violence in media um, needs to be accounted for. And we've proposed a way to do that by creating an offset that storytellers can do to destroy real world guns, invest in local community arts programs every time a gun is on screen or on stage. And it's about 
time. Uh, I almost said something nasty. It's about time because um, we can't ask creatives to stop telling stories that accurately and honestly portray the world in which we, we live, but we can step into the leadership position um, of social good and knowing that that does translate to business good. Um, so I, I also just want to say how brave it is for you to come out and to say, you know, every man has at some point in his life uh, had an objectifying thought or an objective, made an objectifying statement, because that's a huge step forward. Um, and I also think that as women, it is critical for us to support men in that process to acknowledge our role in that because women are not uh, immune to this. There are plenty of women who abuse power. Um, and frankly, the bigger issue, abuse of power, is one that we still have to reckon with. And while we, while we are at this moment of paradigm shift, uh, the shift will stop very quickly if we don't step in and actively do our part to advance it and to make it meaningful and enduring and all those things that we want. Um, so that's a little bit about level forward and, and kind of how we see the world right now. Thank you so much. I mean, it came up again and again, even in doing my book, you know, where I sort of expected to find a lot of, you know, sort of structural issues, how much of it is cultural. Um, so I feel like the storytelling, broadening these experiences that we see on screen is so, you know, important. Um, and I realized that actually all three of you do have something in common in the sense that you're all using culture to shift culture. So Ted, you know, you want to call to men, do that through sports, and Adrian Level Forward does that through film. And Mauricio, um, your company, Wise Entertainment, um, tells stories um, at the intersection of uh, entertainment and social justice and civic imagination. Um, and um, your, your acclaimed series, uh, Islos High, is obviously such a great example of that. Can you just tell us a little bit about that series and the impact that it's had? Um. Yeah, I think that uh, for us, I think it's it's so interesting to be in this panel because it's like full circle. A lot of things that happened. I was talking a little bit with Adrian earlier about like we when we were doing this, it didn't make sense to the market that we were doing it. Everybody was calling us crazy, which is okay. I used to have hair back then when I was doing Islos High uh, for the first time. I think that when we came up, it was Katie's idea of doing. Katie's my partner in the company. My wife, when she had the idea of doing the show was because through research, we discovered that like US Latinos were invisible. They were the, probably one of the most underserved audiences in the galaxy. And suddenly we started like developing this, uh, trying to find the metrics. There was no metrics, no real deep metrics about US Latinos. Everything, their dreams, their fears, their media consumption habits, the, everything, now it's, it's finally happening, it's very thorough, but then we didn't have anything about it. And then the other layer was that we were very worried about how Latinos and Latinas were portrayed in media. We were just looking, just like, wow, this is embarrassing, right? And as a Latino man, I was really uh, shocked by it, because maybe, probably because I grew up in a very, of course, a big Latino market in Brazil. And then when we started doing the research and pitching the show, we, uh, with all this research, and then it was fascinating because we started meeting with everybody, big agencies, big studios, big buyers, and everybody would say, wow, this research is amazing. It's like we never knew anything about US Latinos. We call them Hispanics, actually, right? Because it's how people still call us. And then we love this, but we can't do this show. This show will never see the, the, the light of day. And then we say, but why, right? Back then, I like, to, like I said earlier, I had hair, I was this naive producer, but why you were not gonna buy the show? So we could learn the reasons why. And they would say, this verbatim, one of the top TV executives in Hollywood, he said, the market is not ready for Latinos as protagonists speaking in English. So go back to the drawing board and bring something more relatable, right? Relatable, we know what the meaning of that. And then we started, and then basically what we have to do is, I'm doing a super fast version of what happened. It looks super positive and easy, but it was very hard to do. And then basically uh, we spent two years raising money through grants and donations because 
the field knew that there was something there because we would talk to the president of Ford Foundation and we'd be like, oh no, yeah, we know that this is necessary. We work with these kids in the field and we need that to happen. And then we did that and then we, there was a crucial moment uh, in the process where we uh, shot a quick pilot. Everybody knows the pilot, right? It's like a prototype of a show. Like a, we did like a sizzle reel and then we did it and then we sent to some of the people that were interested Right, F two years la la uh, earlier, the same people that say like, "Oh, send me something." They're probably just being polite, but we send it the same way. And then we start. We got in two hours. We got five calls. Let's wow. We're ready. Let's do this. We were wrong. You're right. This is brilliant. We've never seen something like this. We just have a few notes to give you, but we're ready to throw money at you. And then the notes were generally the three notes that we would receive from big, big, big companies would be the first one would be, "Can it be less Latino?" The second one was, the women are tough. They're tough and they're edgy and they are, they sp they're very, they really ad talk a lot. And they're very, like, they know what they want. Can you make them more, like, calm and more, and they talk a lot about sex. And then we, we, and then we, we would say, do you understand that? By the way, have you ever been to high school? That was the first question back to the, to the and generally guys. And then we say, do you understand, have you ever been to high school first? And the second thing that we said is that, do you understand that 53% of young Latinas in the US at age 20 are pregnant or already have a child? Which through the research, we discovered the role that manhood, the Latino manhood had on those numbers. To your point earlier about blaming women for a lot of things, right? But, and I think that for us it was crucial to go through that process. And then we decided to do what all of our Hollywood experts, advisors told us, we got the money that we got from grants and donations, we shot 24 episodes ourselves, which, you know, you don't do that. It, and it's crazy, you don't do it, you don't do it. That's where I lost the, the rest of my hair, because we did that, we shot in 67 days, we did the show and we shot 10 hours of extra content through different platforms, we had a cooking show, we had a, something for self-seem, we had a vlog with a pregnant mom and all that, and then it was very interesting because, what, because we, we had very little money. We were doing on a shoestring. I remember Katie leading, a, a, like, we did all these focus groups with organizations we were working with. We got, like, I think 250 kids from different neighborhoods to help us with the casting process because we wanted to really innovate the process of doing that. And then there were two guys running for a role. One was going to be the, the, how you say, baby daddy, right? The guy, right? That's the expression you say in English. And the other guy was going to be the good guy. And then we had these two guys do both roles. And then we were presenting this to the girls from these Latina girls. And we remember a crucial moment through the process where the guy, the, so we, they saw both videos. And then the guy who we really wanted to play the, the good guy, he played the bad guy too. Not the bad guy, but like, just like a douchebag, right? He was the guy that we wanted to portray as that stereotypical Latino man, the manhood thing that, the old manhood process that Tad mentioned. And it was like, the girls are just like, oh, I would be pregnant with that guy right away. And they're just like, okay, you're gonna become the good guy. And we made the casting decision based on the fact that we wanted to really reconstruct that thing and then it was a, a great process. We, we, we involved a lot of communities because we built a lot of, uh, work with a lot of organizations. And then after that, we had a lot of offers and we went to Hulu for reason because of the digital platform. We knew that the show needed a bigger audience. And then two weeks later, we beat Grey's Anatomy. So when the show was launched, it became this huge phenomenon, et cetera, et cetera. But to the point of our conversation here, it was very interesting to see through social media and discussions to see that the US Latino community all over the country was, they were talking about manhood and the role of women in a completely different way because they're, they're just like, oh wow, finally someone is showing all these complex layers of the, Latin, the, youth, the, the Latino youth experience, but through the point of view of how boys and girls are building relationships and having careers and all that. So it's uh, because of the, what I said earlier also, Marianne, about for us, the pillar of like the, the, the third pillar of our company about civic imagination, I think that people need to understand in Hollywood and in, in the field that we're representing here is that like civic engagement without having tools of imagination is nothing because people will keep engaging the old models that they 
they have. So we need to give them tools to imagine new scenarios. And I think that, uh, and men have a huge responsibility into that because they've been, it's been very easy for us guys. The imagination has been favoring us for a long time. So I think that that's our role many times to, when it comes to the role that men have in society and the content that we do. Thank you so much. You know, I think it's so important, you know, storytelling and, and seeing truth on, on, on film. And it was funny because yes, somebody yesterday asked me, I, which I hadn't been asked before, what was the most surprising thing that I learned from doing the interviews in my book? And one, it, what it really was when I thought about it was the idea that, um, that women have these internal glass ceilings. Like that it's not just, you know, we make it sort of like all these, you know, sort of restrictions that, you know, come from society, but often it's women and girls who don't see themselves as leaders or don't advocate, you know, to, for, to run for office or for a raise. And so much of that is groomed by the media and by our culture. Um, and, you know, so Adrian, I know that, you know, this is part of Level Forward's work in terms of, um, you know, driving social change by shaping the expectations that we have for ourselves, you know, and for the world around us. Um, but how do you, you know, so in terms of making the connection of like, you know, sometimes they're very separate, the social change activism, but, and, and just impact, how do you um, devise sort of metrics to measure the work that you do? How do you, you know, sort of judge the impact of your projects? So there's the front end, which is the be it, see it end of things, which is the reality that, you know, 4% of motion pictures are directed by Latinos, 3% by Asians. 5% by black Americans, 3.4% of all the high budget motion pictures, that's like 40 million and above, 3.4% are directed by women. These are not statistics from 10 years ago, this is right now. Um, so there's the be it, see it part of it. Um, and then there's the impact part of it. And we've got some tricks up our sleeve, I think that um, we're excited about we, um, we believe that the leverage comes from the capital. And I think this whole conference really speaks to that. Um, that if you can engage financiers and investors, both impact investors and, and capital investors, solely capital investors, in this conversation, that you can provide them with the data to help inform their financing choices. And that that is one of those bottlenecks and one of those inflection points in the, in the cycle um, where we really need to target. So here's an example of what we're doing. We're investing in a database of uh, women who work in storytelling. Directors, DPs, costume directors, everything uh, from A to Z. And we are tracking, and this database is growing, it's 3,000 people, it'll be 8,000 people, it'll be 20,000 people. And we are tracking and incentivizing the studios who claim that it's very difficult to find people, women, people of color, trans people, to work on their television shows, to work on their films, to work on Broadway musicals, to work for them and we are tracking their hiring performance through this database. And we will then have that, those metrics, and we will be able to provide those metrics, not just to investors, but also to local governments that provide tax, tax subsidies for shoots. So that when you go to apply for that California tax credit for 20%, and you're, you're shooting in, I'm gonna use this example, the city of Oakland, and you've hired, a, 89% white Caucasian men, um, they're going to have a lot of empirical reasons for denying you that tax credit. So I think that's one of the, the very specific ways that we approach this. Um, another way is uh, we happen to be a part of the team behind Jagged Little Pill, the Broadway musical. So Jagged Little, and, and Ted knows about this because we've been talking with him about it. Um, this is a, a musical based upon an album written by a woman when she was 19, Alanis Morissette wrote these songs. And they remain as relevant today as they were uh, many years ago. Uh, as old as, older, I am older than that album. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, but uh, that is a story that we have very deliberately 
uh, and, and with experts who understand the issues around consent, around gender identity, imbued in this story, um, not only relevance, but a way of explaining some of these things that is not academic, that is not preaching, that is told through a story that is entirely relatable. And it is the kind of story that you will want to bring your 13, 14, 15, 16 year old children to so that they can have another perspective to see what consent really is. Um, so building stories, maintaining creative excellence, because this is not like, it is not homework to watch these. Maintaining creative excellence, extending the impact of that creative excellence, and then defining what those impact goals are. And I'm gonna pass this to Ted, but it's not just about social media. We all know this. It's not about social media posts. Like we need to track those, that hiring data. We need to track inclusion data. We need to track things in databases that are publicly available. If we knew about settlements and companies had to report settlements pre-Weinstein, we would have been able to see patterns that happened at the Weinstein Company and at many other companies, and not just on the employer side, but hey, I happen to have three payouts in the past 12 months. Maybe it's me. Um, so I think you know transparency around information, collection of data. These are actually tech-enabled solutions that will really help us solve some of these problems. Yeah, and um, I, I do think, you know, going to Ted, because, you know, obviously at a, a conference like this, you know, often the conversation does shift to impact. How does a call to men measure the impact of your work? So that's, uh, so right now the way that things are funded and also what's often measured is we respond to things, whether it's um, this current situation or any allegations or any problem, well, it was four years ago, it was Ray Rice. Then we started talking about domestic violence. Now it's sexual harassment because someone of influence got caught for something that a lot of people do, right? And we intervene. We want to go and intervene. That's intervention. Our work is to go upstream to prevention where it never happens in the first place. That makes sense, doesn't it, folks? That's where we want to be, right? And that bridge from intervention to prevention is men. It really is. Now, this is not an indictment on manhood. It's actually an invitation to men. And it's important that we call men out because there, men need to be held accountable, those who need to be held accountable, that the voice of the victim is heard and hopefully healing comes from that, but we also need to be intentional about calling men in. This is really important because we're all benefiting from it. And those rigid notions of manhood, those behaviors not only harm the man box as we talk about, that man box we're forced to live in not only hurt women and girls and those who don't conform to gender at all, but also men and boys. And, you know, the wonderful thing about this, whether it's uh, when we're doing this work, is that um, whether, no matter who the man is, men of color, black men, white men, we have common ground here because we all have male privilege. So we have this common ground that we get to work on these things together and hopefully do better. So to, I say all that to say that it's difficult to measure prevention because you're, pre you're measuring what's not happening. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, and that's where we need res resources, really, around prevention efforts. Right? We need it because, let me give you an example of why we need it. We, did it. we have a high school curriculum called Live Respect. It's coaching healthy, respectful manhood. It's for middle schools and high schools, actually. We wrote it with Scholastic. It's free online. You can do the webinar, become certified in it. It's done very well around the country. It's also in Kenya, and the earlier version of it is in the UK. We surveyed in our country, all over the country, we actually had one of the pilot schools here in California. We surveyed hundreds of boys in high school, your community and mine. We were very specific around diversity and inclusion and making sure that we had a sample from every different community that we could think of because we knew the problem's universal and the solution is also. And that's what we found. So this is what I wanna share with you all. We asked a number of questions. One of the questions we ask your sons and mine, good boys, is do you know what consent is? High school boys. 19% could tell us what consent was. Eight out of 10 boys did not know what consent was, which explains a lot. 
It explains sexual assault on college campus. It explains sexual assault in the military. It explains why girls and women between 16 and 24 are at the highest risk for being sexually assaulted because our boys think no means try harder or get her drunk. Because those, that's the messages they're getting because we're not having conversations with our boys, dad, men in the room. We're not having moms having conversations, but it's not landing on him the way it needs to when it's, land, when it's, when it's said from a man about, no, we don't do these things, right? So we're not having conversations with our boys about these things. So we don't teach our boys early on about value and respect and boundaries for girls. Actually, think about this. A high school boy in your community taking a young woman out to a, to a movie, right? They're going to see uh, Star is Born, right? Great film, by the way. They're going to see a star born on a Friday night. His name's John. Her name's Kathy. John's 18 years old, good kid, senior in, in high school, taking his friend out, Kathy, to the movie. He talks to his buddies on Snapchat or the group text or something and says, hey guys, I'm taking Kathy to a movie, I'll hit you later. Hit you back later, right? They go to the movie, he, ta and Kathy go he takes Kathy home, he's back at his house, gets back on the group text, and he says, I'm back from the movie. Is the first thing those boys are asking him is how was the movie? Exactly. Because he's not supposed to be concerned about the movie. He's supposed to be concerned about what he's supposed to get from her. Objectification is taught early on. We don't value women and girls. So that's the conversation we need to have. Another statistic was, out of all those boys we asked, 41% said that we asked the question, if you're having sex with a girl and she wants to stop, is that allowed? 41% said no. Once she starts, I got approval all the way through. 41%. Good boys, y'all. These are not boys who are out here looking to be a predator. These are good. These are your sons. I'm telling you, you better have a conversation with them. Because when they go to school, even if they know the right thing, when they go to school and they know the right thing, Marianne, and they say, oh, you know what? They feel inside. Oh, I don't want to be a part of that. But the other two or three boys are saying, oh, you're this, you're that if you're not. This man box, they're pushing him back into the man box so he doesn't do anything about it. So now this young girl has been tragically harmed and this boy's lives are changed because we, they just don't know how to behave respectfully because we've never taught it to them. So we really have to work around this issue of prevention. So measuring it, I could measure it probably more in 10 years from now, but measuring it is a difficult thing that we do a lot of work with coaches and other people who have influence over boys and we have so many testimonies of a coach who says, I'm never going to say to, a, to one of my players, you've got to throw harder, you throw like a girl. I'm never going to do that again. That's huge. Huge. Yeah, no, th thank you so much. And I would definitely, you know, encourage everyone to find out about the Live Respect curriculum, which is already showing dramatic results because those statistics right. that you said shifted yes. after. Yes, thank you for that. You right, after the, after the curriculum, so it's a, it's a nine-week curriculum. There's only two lessons on sexual objectification. There's other lessons around gender, around all kinds of other things, healthy manhood, those kind of things. So it's a nine-week curriculum. So 19% did not know what consent was. At the end, 75% of the boys could say what could, could, de could define consent, which is great. Yeah. Thank can you for that. Can I give a, an anecdotal um, postscript to that? Um, that's an amazing program. And, like, you should be able to scale that program everywhere. And, and everyone should support that. We also have to look at opportunities that we have day in, day out speak to our sons, to speak to our husbands, speak to our partners, our spouses, our business partners, everything. Um, I recently had this interaction with my 17-year-old son who uh, looked at the newspaper one day and looked at Brett Kavanaugh's calendar and said, um, well, Mom, at least he kept a calendar. And I looked at him and you know, I, I really thought deeply about what I should say. Quincy has a hard time keeping a calendar. Okay, there, I've said it. A um, couple days went by. I kind of just absorbed it and wanted to think about it. A couple days go by, and this very brave woman, Ana Maria Archila, steps into the elevator, holds the elevator, and confronts Jeff Flake. And it's captured in a video that everyone sees. And in that moment, she demands 
that he look at her. And she implores him to understand her experience as a woman, as a Latina, as a survivor. And Jeff Flake can't look up. And I sit a couple nights later with my son on his phone watching this video. And he says, after he watches the video, wow, that's incredible. He's clearly moved by this. And it struck me that she was able to tell a story in that moment. And he, she caught the attention of you know, a fairly enlightened kid, but a kid that thought Brett Kavanaugh was you know, okay because he kept a calendar. And he said to me, he turned to me and looked at me and said, I don't think he's okay anymore. His resume cannot make up for his character. And I said, well, that's incredible. And that is a shortcut to illustrate the power that story and voice, and as Ted said, standing alongside. How do you get people to create, how do you create empathy? You find ways of standing alongside. And my, my last note on this is all movements require both sides in order to make progress. White people, we've had to stand up for people of color in order to do our part to complete that process, that conversation. And uh, heteronormative people have to stand up for all the variations and colors of gender and sexual identity. And men, we are essential to the equation. We all know that. And we as women have to find ways of making it okay for them to come in. So level four, as an example, we created a company, yes, mostly women in our company, but there are men and they're fantastic and we cherish them and it's kind of critical to our success thus far. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. I mean, I also agree with you because I think women do have to make space and you know, Ted can attest to this. I've been very you know, intentional about you know, even in my events, having men or interviewing men, it's so important um, that we create that space. Um, so I know I, I want to leave time for questions, but because, well, first of all, I feel like with all that's going on, and it is a very concerning, messy time, but as, as I said, I feel like it's really a fertile time for real transformative change, because I think we're having really real conversations about sexual harassment, about power and privilege, about all of these things that have been under the rug, so if we can you know, create a positive narrative, connect people with you know, communities and resources like this, the event that we have you know, here today. So I wanna end, and again, briefly, because we, we wanna leave time for questions, on um, very quickly, one thing that you see that is working and also you know, a, maybe a specific call to action for everybody here today. Okay, uh, so the call to action, I really want to reach out to the men in the audience because I really feel like we, every man here has um, a platform, whether it's at work, your home, your community, your family, and you have influence. And to start having the conversations that are difficult and to start looking at ourselves and how we might be um, doing things or saying things that, uh, are, that degrade women or someone from the LGBTQ uh, uh, community, non gender non-conforming individual, um, what messages we're passing on to our boys, to allow our boys to have a full range of emotions, to, look, to really support equal pay in your industry as you're looking at the bottom line in the budget, looking at to make sure that women and men are being paid the same, um, but to really look at what is my role, what can I do, because we can't be silent anymore. We're really benefiting from this privilege thing we have we have it whether we want it or not. It's just there for us. Kind of like, if everybody's quiet, we can hear the hum in the room. It's just always kind of there. But we have to pay attention to it. So that's really up to us. And, and, and we're not losing anything. We're actually gaining. We're getting closer to our full humanity. This is really important that we're not losing anything. And this is not about rescuing or saving women. Actually, it's about saving men. And everyone benefits from that. I'm going to limit myself to one, which is uh, share and listen. Share a story. Find someone that is not you, that does not look like you. Share a story about your experience, about who you are, and then listen to their story about their experience and who they are. 
And if you can create that moment of true empathy, you can take that and you can amplify that in a number of different ways in any kind of platform. Just listen and share. Yeah, I think that uh, what I would like to, the call to action I'd like to, I think that we are in a, not we, but like, I think that as a society, we have this obsession with destroying the patriarchy. And as a man who was raised by two matriarchies in Brazil, from both my father and my mother's side, I think that we have this amazing opportunity, and the field even more. The field has, the, to Adrian's point earlier, like the capital and the resources. It's, it's such a beautiful moment to bring the matriarchy back narratives of matriarchy the matriarchy has the blueprint is there and it's about how do you mix those things the good things because the matriarch is a, the, the narratives of the matriarch are so powerful that's one of has been one of our biggest obsessions uh, in our company just like the matriarchy has the blueprint it's not about destroying one thing it's about reviving things that have been happening for hundreds of years we just put it on the side because of the privilege right and i think that there is an opportunity to always bring the perspective and men even more just like what are the things that a female coworker or a partner bring that makes the thing better because i think that and when you get to narrative is the same thing so that's my call to action thank you so much um and i i would know that we have some time for questions so i want to open it up if anybody does have a question and i think also you need to get a microphone probably to the audience okay great um so is there anybody that has a question? Uh, they're, they're actually, yeah, they, they want to capture everything. So if you get it on a microphone. Hello? There you go. Yeah, you're okay. on. Um, so my question is for Ted. You said that uh, men were, uh, or boys in high school went from 19% to 75% understood what consent was. Can you speak to this still missing 25% there? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we needed some more time with them. We, we needed some more time with them. As I said, it was, uh, it was uh, nine weeks, right? And, there's, and two of the weeks were around, one was around sexual objectification and one around uh, sexual assault. And that's where we focused on the issue of consent in particular. The others are focused on uh, the man box, gender rules, media, social media, all of those things as it relates to all the things we're talking about. So, um, so that other 25% we needed some more time with, yeah. But we feel like that's a really big jump considering it's, it was, it was, it's one time a week for 45 minutes. It's, it's set up for a classroom. And um, we actually go in and do the trainings for the teachers, and then the teachers implement the curriculum because we want it to be a part of the institution. Yeah. So there's more work to be done, but we need to start having these conversations. I just want to quickly add, I think it has to be so threaded into everything. Like, I feel like Adrian's story was such a powerful example of just like the teachable moments that are happening and, and cultivating those conversations as well, I think, so that it, it can't just be something. I think it's a combination. Yeah. Can I add something to that? I think it's uh, every time a friend of mine, man or woman, comes, oh, I want to have a child. I have three. And I always like to say this, like, parenting is 50% what you and your partner do. And the other 50% about how other parents raise their kids. Because the moment I send my 13-year-old daughter to school, I can feed PBS to her 24-7. She can listen to Elmo. The moment she goes to school, she's going to be spending more time, many times, with people they are raised in a different way. And I think that that 25% comes to that, too. Just like people are raising their kids in a different way. And, and like they're consuming content and stories. There are... It's still okay to do all the things that consent, yeah. That's a great point. And, I, and let me just add to that. That's a great point. Because even my own children, growing up with me, and I have actually five, uh, four, four, four boys, daughter's the oldest. When those boys come home, even though they've grown up with me and we've always had a lot of social justice conversation and all that, I got to give them a tune-up. I mean, that's what we call it. When you're talking about your son, I was like, she's tuning them up. Right? I mean, you got to adjust this, alter that, change this, you know, f change that filter, put this filter in. Like, because he's going out and getting these messages, it, what we're talking about is counterintuitive to what he's, what he's getting from the rest of the world. You know, um, we talk about our kids a lot, but there are infinite conferences and panels and confabs and convenings for girls and women. We have, you can name them. They are abundant and every weekend. 
there is nothing for boys and there's nothing no, for men. <laughs> except, except for Ted. Um, but think about it. I mean, we're so empowered. My, my teenage daughter, if I had to take, if I was going to suggest to take her to another one of these, she would stage a sit-in and refuse to go because she's heard how powerful she is and she knows it. But my poor son, like, call to men and that's it. Well, so, we, well, we gather our boys in sports to show their power. It's the hyper masculinity and those who don't fit into that. Well, let's talk fall. about tackle football then. Because we got a whole tackle football culture that's um, not a part of this conversation. We, we actually work with uh, the first professional flag football league. And the thing that we love about that is the culture of violence is not a part of the game. Uh, because when you, when you make the focus of sports, getting the other guy and taking him down and you have to put rules in place to make sure that he doesn't, you know, get paralyzed on the field. I love football too, but I mean, using sports, I think it's incredible and I think there's, there's more to go there. Thank you so much. Um, other, and I, I do want to say that there are a lot of resources that are out there that we need to spread the word about, like A Call to Men and other organizations and, and books, and there are resources um, to be found. Oh, yes, she has a question too. Okay. Ted, how are you scaling your curriculum? How do we get it in our community? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, so uh, we go in and do trainings to schools. So we, we're, we're really looking for resources to scale it up. We really are. We're looking to partner with um, uh, school districts. Um, people can, uh, well, we have, we have college initiatives as well. This curriculum in particular was written for middle school and high school, but it's the same it's the same conversation, it's just different examples. Instead of the, instead of the sexual harassment that's happening with girls in the, in the high school hall, you know, the, it's 50% of our girls are experiencing sexual harassment in the schools. And a lot of it happens in the hallways, but one of the most threatening places for the girls is in the stairways going up. Because the boys kind of hang out there. That's like the construction site for the, for the, for the, for the, for the schools. That's where the boys, you know, really kind of um, demonstrate the manhood that we've taught them that they should be living up to, meaning my generation of men, our generation of men, men. We're passing this down to them. We're passed down to us. So we're looking for resources to always scale it up. It can be done on your own, online, but that's where we're really looking for resources to go into school districts, to adopt schools, and to put the curriculum in. There's a couple schools that we've, we've followed up with and done a second year because there's been resources for it. So we really need resources to do that. We also have college uh, uh, campus initiatives that we're involved in, lots of education and training. There's lots of things that we're, a lot of programming that we do, but, you know, it needs resourcing. And I just want to add, because I did the article with you on it, A Call to Men, you know, in the wake of Me Too, did this amazing campaign, I Will Speak Up, which is also like men's role in giving, and it was a great campaign that used a lot of well-known actors and, you know, sort of male figures um, to model what it looks like for, for a man to speak up on this um, and be an advocate, because I think that's another way that we, you know, can importantly create change on an individual basis. Um, Okay, let's see, is there any other questions? Yes. Hi, my name is Arielle. I wanna thank you all so much for the work that you're doing. And I also, you were mentioning that there aren't enough resources and there's not enough education. And I completely agree, which is why I founded an organization called Gender Illumination. And the work that we do is we do education both for youth and adults around gender expansion, gender inclusion, and gender education. So we are, as you were saying, we're stuck in this world where there's so much around gender roles and gender stereotyping. And the work that we're doing is giving people the space to explore human potential. And we also are giving a space for young people to explore the idea of gender queerness, gender non-binary, and living outside of the traditional gender roles and expectations. And so I'm curious for all of you where you see trans people fitting in and non-binary people. And also I would love to just connect more and potentially collaborate with all of you. Sure. Um, you never, you very rarely see trans people on set. 
behind the camera and even more rarely in front of the camera. We're working with Laverne Cox right now on a documentary called Disclosure, Trans People uh, and the History of Story. Um, it's excellent, it's one documentary. Um, but on that one documentary, there was an apprenticeship program so that you could have trans people on set, even those that did not have the experience needed to be in those positions, and they were mentored and they shadowed uh, the other people on set who were doing the work. And that program is now, we are kicking that program up and we are working with another organization called Arts to Work, which is a nationwide apprenticeship program funded by the Department of Labor. And the trans component is now going to be extended nationwide. So it's a huge win. Um, and we're super happy about it. Uh, but trans, gender queer, disabled, when do you see those characters on screen pursuing their dreams? We need more capital to fund more stories so that we can see it and then we can aspire to, to, to be more comfortable with it and to be it, um, if that's what speaks to you, so. Yeah, um, if I could add to that. I think that for us, it really is about the, there's so many layers of inclusion, right? Because I think that it's something that we we're talking earlier about Nina Shaw. Nina always says that about like, if you don't have a place in the room, on the table, you bring your chair. I think that that's very important for, and in Hollywood that's happening more and more. And I think for us, it is, the, there's a layer of authenticity, right? We were having this, we had this amazing script come our, you know, to our project, to our company. Beautiful script written by this, uh, uh, gay writer, and it was about a trans experience. Beautiful, I cried, I read three times, I cried three times, very powerful. And then we had to have a conversation about like, you can't, you need to bring at least someone to consult, but you need to be ready to share credits. You need to be ready to share the creative power of your script because this is not your experience. This is something that you need to be, and that's something that, a, a credit seems like a very simple thing, but in Hollywood, if you go to the WGA website, it's, which is the, the guild for writers, and I think that those are the things, the conversation we need to be having, right? Because I think that we, uh, the ecosystem is designed for the, the margins to fail, but we need to have this conversation about, uh, uh, about like power, because it's about power, right? It's very, Make a movie about transgender character is 10% of the power, but you need to have this whole supply chain involving those people because then it's the real impact of that. And I think for us it was a great conversation because the writer was just like, okay, that makes sense. And it's a hard conversation to have with any writer, any writer to do that. And I think that those conversations are happening more and more. And of course you still have, I would say that still 50% is just like, oh, I need to hire a black guy because I have I have crazy conversations in Hollywood with people just like, do you know any Latino guy because I'm doing this project and I need to have a Latino just like, I'm wrong, the wrong person for you to, to ask because I'm going to say hard things to you that you don't want to hear because it's not affirmative action. It's like, it's going to be a better cultural product and you're going to make more money and people are going to get hired. It's about creating an ecosystem around it and I think that that's, uh, that's how to, and it's so simple. You just need to hire, you need to find it. I think that uh, to uh, uh, your point earlier about creating a database, because there is a fallacy that they don't exist, that we don't exist, right? The big producer last week said that, I don't know where the female directors are. There are no women that want to direct horror movies. You're like, really, my friend? And then, of course, the pushback was huge. And for the trans community, it's even bigger, because also I think that it's like Native Americans now. It's so sexy to Hollywood, Native Americans and trans people. But for the, the change to really happen, the resources and the capital needs to be around you. Like, guys, this is gonna be a 95% crew and be, be front of the camera, behind the camera. I remember when we did this Los High, we had white executives coming to our set on season one. They would ask, it was so funny, because it's like, it was like the semi-woke moment in Hollywood. Be, and they were like, where did you find all these brown people? They would ask me directly that. Where did you find this black female cinematographer? There are only three in the whole country. 
So I end with that. It's the same thing, but I think that it's we're in a fundamental moment where capital for both sides, for money making or for impact, to find there's an opportunity to create a complete new ecosystem around new voices. So. I just want to, I, I realize that we are, we're now out of time, and I know there's going to be another session, but I, I first of all want to thank this incredible panel um, for the powerful conversation we had here today, and all of them do really important work, so please, you know, find out more and uh, support them. Um, I, of course, want to thank all of you, and I also want to invite you to go to whatwillitake.com. Um, please sign up to our mailing list. Um, we'll be having, you know, more events like this one. Um, we're hoping to really foster ongoing dialogue and community, connect people to resources, and we really want to hear from you and your ideas and feedback. So, again, thank you all so much. Uh, we really and appreciate thank it. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Marianne.